Happy Sunday. As you can see, we are very serious about the whole uh, procedures needing for safety. Uh, I was at another occasion where I, I was to speak in a, a, a standing like this. And there were other speakers as well. After every speaker, a lady will come out and spray and then slowly wipe everything down. All that. It's always remind me of wrestling, you know, in between the wrestling match, some lady will come out with a sign and walk round and round. It's a very strange thing. But at the same time, it is very needed uh, because the reality is that we are still in the middle of difficult time. Uh, I have some sad news to announce. A while ago, we had our brother, the Reverend Dr. Richard Pratt, with us from the third millennium, and he came with an entourage of people, one of whom is a person by the name of Tom DeWitt, uh, and he met some of you. Tom DeWitt is a vice president of continual development of the third development. I think that was his title. I was informed early this January that he went into ICU because of COVID. Uh, I received news on Thursday that the Lord took him home. So for those of you who know him, I, I thought I would want to share this news with you. But uh, for me, I was speaking to him about collaboration with Third Millennium Ministry. It is a ministry that I support strongly. I think it's a wonderful ministry. For those of you who are not aware, Third Millennium Ministry is a ministry that teaches seminary-level kind of work using multimedia. So they are able to go around the world uh, to benefit the whole world by using the multimedia. So it's a very worthwhile ministry to support. And uh, Tom and I discussed a lot of collaborative uh, projects and I linked them up with some sponsors as well. And I was thinking of doing more. And then the COVID came and everything sort of hang. Uh, but still, it is a time where you feel comforted that knowing that this person is definitely of the lot. So in that sense, like all, all news that I receive about people going back to the lot, there is really a strong comfort that uh, we will see each other again. So that's something that is really very real to us. Ah, okay, our friends on video. Who is the first one? Is that Michael Kang? Oh, okay. <laughs> Michael Kang and New and Gang. Hello. You know, wave your hands. Hey, the rest of you turn on your video. La. Let us see your face. Who are these people? Who is the third person? I can't quite see. Is that William or Evan or who? Can't quite tell. I, I can't quite see because I'm at an anger. But welcome to all of you, including those who are on cyberspace. Thank you so much for being with us. Okay, let us uh, proceed for the lesson today. And uh, today is a very unusual day, actually, because we complete the Gospel of Luke today. Uh, we started in July the 21st, 2019. So that's like one and a half years. <laughs> And uh, next week, we are going to start on the Paul's letter to the Ephesians. And I will next week, I will do a rundown as to some of the major uh, books that we have covered so far. And I must once again share with you that it is with great joy that I get to uh, be the pastor of this place because it's not just about pastoral work. It is also truly a learning experience for me. When Before I be began to accept the invitation from Dr. Seven Tong to pastor this church. Uh, I was already preaching every single week in many, many different places. So in one of the conversations I had with Dr. Tong, he, he asked me, so, so what, what is it that you do? I said, well, I, I never go back to my own church because every week I'm somewhere else. And Dr. Tong told me that, you know, if you keep doing this, you are not going to be able to build anything because everywhere you go, you are preaching a topic that people will have thrown to you. That's what guest speakers do. They, the church invited you and said, okay, we want you to preach on this topic. And they will invite you in the early, very beginning of the year. And they will send out all the invitation. And then you say, okay, I'm going to come to your church this day, that day, that day. And it's all random. So this week, you may be preaching on this topic. The next week, you go to another church, you preach on another topic. And I thought Dr. Tong was right that at the end of the day, you're not going to be able to build anything. And so he said, you know, you must prayerfully consider whether the Lord is calling you into a ministry of pastoral work where you build a community together. 
Uh, and at the same time, he also told me that, you know, when you are building a community together, in pastoral preaching, you are able to then build knowledge as well. And so the Reformed Evangelical Church plays quite a lot of emphasis on expository preaching. So we, we go through book by book, as opposed to topical preaching. Because topical preaching, you jump, 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 jump. So Dr. Tong too would do expository preaching, except that compared to him, I'm a lot faster. Uh, for him, the book of Hebrews, for example, takes years because one verse, he would, few words, okay, he can take like three, four weeks just on a, on a few words. Uh, Chrissy, you will know, because we do the evening expository preaching as well. And so, and but through it all, of course, like I always say, the preacher gets to learn the most because he has to grapple with the text. Uh, next to the preacher will be the translator because the translator cannot fall asleep. So he has to listen to everything twice, once in one language, and then he has to speak it out in another language. And so I'm very blessed to be able to do both. And this is the thing that you must consider as well. This is the reason why I also invite you to write your daily, de de write daily devotional. Because when you want to write something, then all of a sudden you're forced to think through some of the Bible verses that you feel so close to and then you want to con put it in 450 words, 500 words or so, and you have to struggle with the, with the text. So I know that uh, some of you feel that you are not good writers or whatever, but it is a question of practice, and I know that a lot of you can do it. So I do want to continue to encourage you to look at our uh, daily devotional. Uh, let me flash the daily devotional uh, screen again. I'm not going to do this for too long uh, because... After a while, you, you get sick of it. Can I have my slide, please? And the daily devotional uh, address is here. So for those of you who have not yet signed up, please do. And uh, basically what happens is that every day, a daily devotional material will be sent to you via email. And these are written largely by myself and contributors from our congregation and also some people from outside. Uh, one more thing I wanted to share with you. Next week, we will begin the Catechism class. And this is the Zoom meeting address for Catechism. For those of you who are going to join by Zoom and you are watching this via cyberspace, you may want to take a picture of this so that you can come on at 11.30 next week. We are starting next week, not this week. Uh, sorry, some of you are mistaken. We are starting next week, 11.30 for Catechism class. And those are the details. Either you go to zoom.com and put in the meeting room number or you just use the URL to access. So it will be both live and Zoom at the same time. Uh, I, of course, encourage you to be here live for those of you who want to join. Remember that you need to join the class if you plan on getting baptized or you plan on getting transferred in membership to us. Uh, you, you need to do that. And also confirmation, those of you who plan on you are baptized as an infant and you plan on uh, being confirmed as an adult, you also do need to attend Catechism class. It's also, of course, open to anyone. doesn't matter whether you want to do this or not, because it is a, a good session of question and answer session. And then we use the Westminster Confession of Faith as a backing material. Uh, it's not an exam or whatever it is. So it is a, I always find that it's a very good time for us to discuss in depth as to what our faith really is all about. Now let's get back to Gospel of Luke then. Now today we will close the Gospel of Luke. Let's review what was taught in the last lesson. The last lesson, second last lesson, was entitled Burning Heart. It was really about one of the most wonderful short story ever, The Road to Emmaus, the event that happened on the very day of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, involving two disciples who were not part of the original 11. And these people were leaving Jerusalem. So there are no written reason why they were leaving Jerusalem, but there's a good likelihood that, like everybody else, they were running away from the disaster, disastrous thing that happened to their founder and the, of their faith, the, the master that they followed. And what happened was that our Lord Jesus Christ appeared uh, with them. And one of the first things that happened was that the Bible says their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And during lies the lesson because sometimes our eyes are kept from recognizing the Lord. And in Reformed teaching especially, we do believe that 
God in his perfect wisdom may keep some people from knowing him. And this is quite clear in the Bible. But for this, it was a temporal blindness so that Jesus Christ could continue to teach them. And so Jesus asked them, so what happened? Where are you guys going? And they responded to Jesus, did you not know? Big event has happened in Jerusalem. So one of the key lessons we do learn is that the historical facts of the crucifixion cannot be denied. You know, when I was preparing for the sermon, I came across a lot of counter-argument by many people, including people of other faith, that many people deny the crucifixion, say that it cannot be, that Jesus was not really crucified. But of course, the other one is that people deny that Jesus was resurrected. But here you can see that it was such a big event that everybody knew about it. And, and they described that the person who got crucified as Jesus, a prophet mighty in deed and word. So I took the opportunity to remind you that actually we are all like the people who are walking towards Emmaus. We are very superficial in our faith. We consider our Lord Jesus Christ as a prophet, mighty in deeds and word. And we don't quite understand who he really is all about. And our Lord Jesus Christ took the opportunity to explain from the Bible. And so herein lies one of the key reasons why we believe in sola scriptura, by the word alone. This is a very classical reform understanding because we believe that Jesus Christ could have said anything. That is one occasion where he could have said anything, could have manifested anything, but yet he patiently explained the Bible from Moses to all the prophets. So Luke said that he explained in great detail uh, what his ministry is all about. And so for us, it's the same. We are always based on God's word because we believe that God has chosen to use his word as the primary vehicle to reveal his truth. I use the word primary because we do accept that God can use other means as well. But that's the main thing. This is why the Reformed Evangelical Church, together with all Reformed churches, place so much emphasis on the Bible, the Word of God, and not just on how we feel or the phenomena you see or visions or dreams or, or things like that. Because our Lord Jesus Christ Himself did that. And in the end, when Jesus revealed Himself to them finally, the people said, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the... So from here, we see that when the scripture is open to us, when we understand, when the Holy Spirit enlightens us in our heart, our heart should burn with passion, with love, with overwhelming sense of, of gratitude, of joy. And today's passage actually will continue that thought. And so the question then is, was asked, why then would we have a cold heart? And today we want to think about this actually a little bit further. One of the key reasons is that God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. And after preaching last week, I thought that I better explain this a little bit further. And so in today's closing passage and closing sermon of Gospel of Leo, I want to touch on this a little bit further. So let's come before the Lord and give Him thanks and commit the time into His almighty hands. We thank you, God Almighty, for leading us step by step, week by week, through the learning from the lessons from the Gospel of Luke. We do want to pray that you remind us once again that you oppose the proud and give grace to the humble. So may we be able to set aside all that is blocking us from you. Maybe we feel that we are so much better than people who preaches the word of God, we know you so well, we don't need to learn anymore. Or perhaps it's the other way around. We think that we are so far away from you that we are not worthy to come to you, which is a form of pride too. Grants to us the grace to be humble and teachable as a little child would before his heavenly father so that we will hear your voice, we will recognize it, and we will turn and follow you. Have special mercy on your unworthy servant. May the words of his mouth and the meditation in all our hearts and mind be deemed acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So let's carry on to close the chapter then. In Luke 24, verse 36, As they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. Now earlier we were talking about the two persons going along the road to Emmaus. 
And in the end of that passage, they met with the other disciples and started to tell them about how they had met Jesus. And as they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. So it is. it was a miraculous kind of appearance of our Lord Jesus Christ. He suddenly appeared. And verse 37 says, But they, start, they were started and frightened and thought that they saw a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your heart? And so again, a contrast between the appearance of our Lord Jesus Christ and the reaction of the people. Remember that these people have followed him for many years, at most three and a half years, if you count from the beginning of his ministry to the very end. They will have seen all sorts of miracles, the feeding of the 5,000, the healing of the blind, the lame walk, uh, walking on the sea, all kinds, you know, all the, all the various miracles and signs and wonders that we have gone through when we went through the Gospel of Luke. But still, you know, when actually when Jesus appeared, as he himself has predicted and prophesied, the people were started and frightened at the thought of it. I want to once again remind you that we too are often troubled and frightened because we are of little faith and we are just filled with so much doubts in our life. In some manner, I suppose it's a kind of consolation. I know that all of us in our journey of faith has our own ups and downs, of course, including myself. And you know, there's sometimes that you feel that, man, you know, I've gone through so much, I have learned so much, I have gone to the seminary, I have studied and I have been with Dr. Tong or I've been whatever it is. And still, I am started and frightened when I discover something unusual, when I find a lump in my body somewhere, when I hear news that suddenly come out from nowhere. So certainly I am of little faith. So in a sense, it's a little bit comforting, I think. Like the early apostles and disciples, we can be of little faith even after many years of learning. I don't know whether you were watching the video anthem closely. You know, we, we pick all these things, whether the video anthem or the songs, to follow the theme of the preaching, actually. So the video anthem is Tell Me the Old Story. One of the stanza is Tell Me the Story Often, for I forget so soon. Tell me the story often. Tell me the old story of Jesus Christ. So we sit here and we listen to a gospel story. You like yawn and very sien because you keep telling me the same old story. But the story has to be told over and over again, for I forget so soon. And so my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, you see, that was the case for the early apostles and the disciples who walked with Jesus, saw him, touched him, spoke to him, saw the miracles firsthand. And yet they were started, all of them, uh, not, no exception. They were all started and they were all filled with doubts. So in a sense, don't be too surprised that we are like that too because we are stubborn and stiff-necked people and we forget so soon. And the next few verses are most touching and most intimate. Verse 39, Jesus Christ said, See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For our spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed him, them, his hands and his feet. Now, Jesus Christ showed them his hand and his feet because there are scars there, that he was pierced on the hand and pierced on the feet and also on the side as well. Now, in the whole of the Bible, only the Gospel of Luke and the Gospel of John recorded the scars of Jesus Christ and the incident of Jesus letting the disciples or offering to let the disciples to touch the scar. The other place is in the Gospel of John. John 20, as we have went through this before with Thomas, right? Because the Apostle Thomas says that, you know, you guys say that he is resurrected. I don't believe. Unless I get to touch him, unless I get to put my finger inside he, he's the place where he was pierced, I will never believe. And John 20 verse 27, Jesus appeared and said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it on my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. And like I explained to you, many medieval painters then painted all this picture of Thomas putting his hand there. And so we call Thomas Dupting Thomas. Actually, he quite swear uh, because John sort of recorded this for him. 
we are all adopting Thomas's, isn't it? But too bad for him because John recorded. So as if among all the apostles, he was the only one who adopted. But today in Luke, you see not true. All of them were few we adopted. And the paintings were wrong because Thomas, from here, you know Thomas did not touch Jesus. He was completely flawed. The very next verse says, Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. The Bible did not say that Thomas said, okay, let me try it out and, and try and then say, my Lord, my God. No, immediately. Now he knows because our Lord Jesus Christ appeared to him. And the verse that really, really moved me greatly. And Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And so I told you, that I think two weeks ago when we preached on this, that you guys are the one that this verse is referring to. Blessed are you if you have not seen and still believe, unlike Thomas. When we read about the scars of Jesus Christ, I don't know whether if you have ever wondered this question, why the scars after the resurrection? You know, when I was preaching through this, I kept talking about the contrast between the facts of the crucifixion and the resurrection and other faith. Because those who do not believe in the crucifixion and resurrection kept proposing different theories as to what happened. One of the theories is that actually Christianity is invented by some of these early people who follow a pretty good teacher called Jesus. Maybe Jesus never even existed. So a whole bunch of people gathered together and said, come on, let's write about some religion to liberate our people because the Jews are being oppressed by the Romans, right? So let's say a couple of you gather together and say, let's invent a new religion. What would you do in this religion? What must you say? What, what kind of a, a god or goddess or whatever it is that you must have? The end result will be what we see in many religions today. Kind of glorious gods, right? I mean, some kind of a whatever powerful god that you can have. I was once in Malacca, I remember. And I went to one of those local temples. And because I'm fascinated with the arts, so these are places where you can see a lot of human imagination going on. And I must be very careful, right? Because we, we do want to respect the fact that people have a right to believe what, what they believe. And I came across an idol that was quite interesting. So they were worshipping this idol. There is the head of a woman, the body of a lion, and the first two front was that of a eagle's claw. So it's very similar to Greek concept of the gryphon. And then, but the lion's tail was a scorpion tail. And then this idol has bat wings, like Batman bat wings, big bat wings. And there were fangs in front of the woman's face. So therefore, it, be, it is an idol that they worship and they were like burning incense and, and stuff like that. So that's very classical. Meaning you want to worship something, you must put together all the most powerful, whatever it is, right? You know, add in tail, add in this, add in all the most powerful features you kind of join together. And so if you want to talk about a saviour that has conquered death, that is resurrected in glory, why in the world would you have this saviour have scars still carrying in the body? I mean, you, are, you have victory already over death, right? Once you appear with full glorious body and, I don't know, add a few heads and many arms or something like that, if Christianity is a faith that has been invented by human imagination. So therein lies the interesting feature about the Bible. The honest, very straightforward recording of things that are factual as opposed to the figment of your imagination. Because if you were to imagine this, you will never have a situation where Jesus Christ, the resurrected saviour of the entire world, would still appear with scars in his hand and scars in his feet and scars on the leg. So why would this be needed? The answer is that the scars are really not meant for God. The scars must be meant for us, for people like us, because we are fallen, we are stubborn, people who are of little faith, and we forget oh so soon. The scars of our Lord Jesus Christ cannot be for God to see. It cannot be. It has to be for us. 
And the scars are a combination of what I told you our gospel is based on. The two facts, the crucifixion and the resurrection, not one or the other. The crucifixion and the resurrection are both seen in the scars of the living Christ. The scar represents his crucifixion for sure. It reminds you that this is a crucified Christ. And the fact that he's living represents the resurrection. And the two combine together to give us the glorious gospel message. And the scars of Jesus Christ really, once again, remind fallen, stubborn people like us of the pain and suffering of our Lord Jesus Christ. And for me, most of all, that his love for us, that he loved us so much that he would even have scars in his body for all eternity to remind us of his love. That's really something that boggles the mind. And I'll tell you this, you know, especially for those of us who grew up in church, right? I mean, since I, I, I mean, I'm a person who grew up in church. I was in church since I was five. And you sing all kinds of songs, right? Jesus loves me, this I know. What's the next verse? For the Bible tells me so. And you sing, 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 sing. Prayerfully, as you grow older, you begin to phantom what does it really mean, you know? Jesus loves me, this I know. How do you know? Because the Bible tells you so. Oh yeah, okay, it's written in here somewhere. But you know, even as I prepare the sermon, I and of this car, and I will tell you honestly, I have not thought about this too much, you know, until I come across this. So you all should go and become a preacher, man, because it will help you learn a lot. He loved us so much that he's willing to bear the scars, not for himself, but for us. That's crazy, man, you know, that he would, he would, God will love us so much that he, he would carry the scars just to make sure that we are people who understand that we are reminded that he suffered like us. He, he went through all the pain and suffering just like us. So on the passive side, right? No matter what you have gone through in your life, as the book of Hebrews says, he has gone through it. By faith, we know he has gone through it. And the scars is a reminder for us all. So there is nothing that you can go through in this life where you say, hey, nobody understand me. Nobody know it. I am so tough. I'm suffering all by myself. Not possible. The scars of Jesus Christ remind you that he has gone through it all. So there is no claim on our part against him. It's the other way around. He has loved us so much that he's willing to suffer for us. And then in verse 41, while they still disbelieve for joy. So even after the scars were shown to them, some of them is still disbelieved. And we see that in the Bible, in the Great Commission, right? Last part of Gospel of Matthew. They worship him, but some still don't believe. So, you know, it's like, wow, this is really scary that we are really very far away from him. And he said to them, have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate before them. So let me be very clear. Our Lord Jesus Christ was not a vegetarian because he eat fish. <laughs> so I, I need to say that because there are some books out there that keep proclaiming that he's a vegetarian because vegan culture seems to be a very attractive thing. No way. This a, he ate the bright fish uh, before them. And here, one of the side lessons is the mystical nature of the resurrected body. So again, if you want to spin a story about a resurrected God, a resurrected master of yours, a religious leader, then surely he don't have to eat, right? I mean, what was this deal about him eating and all that? The Bible does not give us very clear, detailed description of what the resurrected body is really all about. But there are some clues. For example, Jesus will appear suddenly, disappear suddenly. He even though the door is locked, he can appear in the upper room with the apostles. And here you see that he can eat. And he can be touched too. So the, the people could, could touch him. So it's, it's not like, a, like the kind of thing we imagine, the kind of spirit that run here and there. The Bible did not record the detail of the resurrected body because that's not the focus uh, at all. The focus is that he is reason. And here, again, the emphasis is that he is just like us. Verse 44 then, he said to them, These are my words. Again, going back to the word of God that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that 
everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. So we have gone through this theme a little bit in the previous weeks as well, that the certainty of God's truth must progress. And this is something that you must remember, that when we say we are followers of Jesus Christ, we are not talking about something that may happen, may not happen. We are not talking about a theory that will work if a lot of us believe and will not work if only few people believe. No. The Bible has always taken the position that everything is about the unfolding of God's will. It must happen. It's not something that suddenly happened by accident, but something that has been planned by God Almighty from the beginning. And next week, when we touch on Ephesians, you will see it's not even about the beginning. It is before the beginning. And the election of God is done before the foundation of the world. So that's what it's all about, you know. It's not like, you know, I accidentally become a Christian and don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Huh? Maybe maybe bad things will happen to me in my life. Then what, what will happen? It will, we are just filled with all these kind of doubts. It is not. So earlier when I shared with you the home going of our brother Tom DeWitt, right? For me, it is a sadness. It's like a sadness if any one of you would go back with the Lord. Or a sadness if I would go back to the Lord as well. Yesterday, I conducted a wedding and I told the people that, you know, one of the most fun things for a pastor to do is to conduct weddings because it's great joy, right? Bride is pretty, a groom is handsome, it's just very fairy tale like and a lot of fun. The thing that's not so fun about being a pastor is to conduct what? Funerals, yeah, so that's the other one. The Chinese call the, the wedding to what color? Red. Funeral, white, yeah. So I'm more the other way around. I'm more wear white during wedding. <laughs> so early days, when missionaries came to China, they were all very shocked. How come you go wear white during wedding? It's a hong pai. And when you conduct funeral, of course, that's very sad. But I must tell you also that if it is for someone who belongs to the Lord, like our brother Tom DeWitt, or folks like any one of us who we know is with the Lord, it's a different ball game. Of course, there's sadness, but there's assurance, absolutely. And so I don't mind conducting funeral for brothers and sisters who are in the Lord. And by the way, I've been booked by some people already. Can you imagine that? <laughs> people say, Pastor Yong, next time when I go, I'll make sure you, you go and tell my husband that I already booked you. I don't want anybody to conduct uh, my funeral. Well, to some extent, it sounds a bit morbid, but it's fine. Because we are part of the whole plan of God. I pray that you understand that. I pray with all my heart that you understand that. So you are not panicking, you are not frightened, you are not always cast with all kinds of doubts in your life. But again, because we are stubborn and stiff-necked, we have problem understanding. We forget also soon. The Bible then says, Then he opened their minds to understand the scripture. So we are cast back to last week's lesson. The two persons on the road to Emmaus did not see him until finally he opened their eyes. And then they said, hey, you know, earlier when he described the scripture to us, was it not true that in our heart there's this, we, there's, we just burned, we, we had this great zest and great realization when he spoke. To us. And last week I told you that the opening of the mind and heart, the Westminster Confession of Faith says, comes when the Holy Spirit in your heart enlighten you to the Word of God, which is what Jesus did. Jesus explained the Word, open it up to them. So here is the same thing. Why is it that some people read the Word of God and they don't get anything? They don't believe. They think it's stupid. The answer is because the word was not open to them. And I went to illustrate to you some of the scripture passage. Matthew 7, 7, 8, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, Ask, and you will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and you will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, it will be opened. The charismatic church used this and said, that means you can ask anything from God. 
What do you want? You want a Lamborghini? Ask from God. Cho Yong Gi in Korea wrote a book called The Fifth Dimension, where he said that all you need to do is ask in faith. Not only must you ask in faith, you must ask in details. Absolute detail. The more detail you have, the clearer it is with God. And you also demonstrate that you really, 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 really want. A bit like Spice Girl song. Uh. Tell me what you want, what you really, really want. <laughs> the, the more detail you are, God can see the sincerity in your heart. So the illustration I always give you is that you want a car, right? It's not just any car. You must go and tell God what's the brand. Ah, downstairs, downstairs, downstairs in this place, all this luxurious car. You know, when we first started our church, they thought that I'm a potential customer, you know, because, you know, I wear this and walk, right? Wow, then the car salesman, very excited, they come out. Then they saw that I'm carrying a Bible, then all turn around and walk away. <laughs> so you want one of those Telsa, is it? Am I right? Is, is that the one Telsa ele electric is it? car? I mean, they look really nice, right? You want one of those? You go tell God, lah, say, hey, Hey, boss. Sometimes I call God boss, you know. You know I want that, that one. Not good enough. You must tell him the model number. What's the model? What color? What kind of wheel you want? Is it the, with the spoke, with the sports rim, with the whatever it is? What kind of horsepower? License plate. Can I? A, 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 A. <laughs> Although I'm Christian, but, you know, A, 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 A sounds good. I want A, 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 A. Can you smell the leather? Yeah, God, I want that. Like the Mahagani wood, everything down to the last detail. And Cho Yong Gi says, if you tell God everything, because the Bible says, ask and you will be given to you, tomorrow morning you will appear outside your house. If it doesn't appear, it is because you have no, yeah, so it's very simple, Pao Jiao An, like sell durian, Pao Jiao An. If you ask, to the last detail, because Bible says us, it will be given to you, it will be given to you. And if you don't have, too bad, lah, because you didn't have enough faith. Please, if you read the Sermon on the Mount, starting from Matthew 5, Matthew 6, chapter 7, you know that this is a continuation of the thought process of the entire Sermon on the Mount. Jesus Christ was referring to the things of God, love, forgiveness, strength for faith, not for that Telsa car or whatever it is. And so this is a complete misinterpretation. Still, you have to ask the question, yeah, fine, you, Pastor, you say that it's about things relating to faith. There are many people who also ask, right? I mean, you guys ask too, right? Often time you come to God and say, you know, I have not enough faith, like whatever it is. Can I, can I have more faith? Can, can you... Can you give me more love? Can you give me more kindness? Why is it that it doesn't happen? And then I look at other people, wow, you know, like the two fellow on the road to Emmaus, their heart is burning for the Lord. Mine don't have, mine like cold like a overnight pizza like that, you know, not happening. Why? The Bible has the answer. James 4.3, you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You're not asking for the glory of God. You're asking for your own glory. I must confess to you that when I was young, right, when people bully me, since I've been in church, since I was five, right, I, I mean, God is kind of like my body, right? I, when I was young, I always pray, God, can you give that fellow a stomach ache, uh, please? Don't kill him, uh, just stomach ache, and lao sai all day long. Lao ka kui kao that type, uh, that, that, that's, that's the best. And, and But nothing happened. Why? This is, you ask for your own passion, for your own purpose. It's not for the glory of God. It's not for the will of God. And the one I highlighted last week, because God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Matthew 18, 3, Truly I say to you, Jesus said, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, I want to emphasize that when you ask of God, when you pray, when you read the Bible, there are many reasons why your heart is not burning like the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. I will submit to you that these are the key reasons. Pride. The idea that I know everything. I'm just here to, you know, entertain you. It just completely fills our life. And 
we come to God with a attitude that is just not right. And so James 4, 6 come. You may ask, but because you ask with pride, and pride, many theologians believe, is actually the source of the biggest sin and the original sin, actually. When Adam and Eve fell, it was because of pride, because they think that they know better than God. And so think about your life. Think about why your heart is not burning like the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. Can you identify where their pride is? In my prayer earlier, I said that the pride could be because you think you are a big deal, that you are very capable, you already know everything. It can be the other way around also, you know. The pride is a reverse pride, where you think that you, you are such a failure, you are, you, you are not deserving, you are unworthy, and you take pride in that unworthiness. This is something quite interesting. There was a time when I was with a friend who is a very brilliant guy, one of those top scholar person, and uh, I, I can't remember what we were talking about, right? So, and then I was making noise about people wearing expensive watches. You know, I, I work with Patong, so sometimes you get to meet people who are very well off. There was this person who was driving a car. Then Dr. Tong was in a car, and then the fellow has a watch that's Rolex something like, you know, our senior pastor is an expert in watches. So let's take a look at it and say, this one, this is a Rolex, don't know what, 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 what year. Da, 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 da. Then the guy said, wow. Then Dr. Tong said, I think, let me see, 40,000 US dollar, isn't it? The driver said, no la, patong, no la, not 40,000. Then I thought, wow, okay la, maybe he was wrong. Follow pause for a while and say, 68,000 US. So I was complaining to my friend and say, you know, uh, these people, you look at my watch, mine is a $100 watch. And my friend looked at me and said, you know what you are? I say, what? This is called reverse snobbery. <laughs> reverse snobbery. You are going around telling people that you are very high and mighty because you wear a seagull brand <laughs> watch. You're not humble. You are just being snob on the reverse, reverse side. And you know, there's something that I, I thought about a lot. And, 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 and so nowadays, I don't go tell people that I wear cigar watch anymore. This is a reverse kind of pride. And it is very true. One of the illustrations that Dr. Tong gave very much is that, you know, sometimes when we think about the preachers in our life, especially now with Zoom, right? We don't quite know what will happen when we so-called normalize because a lot of you are on Zoom. And when you're on Zoom, you have a lot of choices. You listen to this preacher, ah, it's so boring. This guy is so lousy. Let me switch. I listen to that preacher also. Uh, this one not bad, but the other one better. I switch. I, talk, 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 talk. I switch, 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 isn't it? And we like to make a lot of noise. Yeah, I learned nothing from this preacher. Dr. Tong says this in his illustration, that if you have a waterfall, Great preacher, one of the best in the world, like a giant waterfall, and then lots of water coming in. And you are like a bottle that try to receive the water. If your bottle has a stop on it, you go put the water bottle underneath this giant waterfall. It, you can live there for one million years, okay? Nothing will happen because you have a stopper on the mouth of your bottle. So if you approach the preaching or whatever with a heart full of pride, and this guy is nothing, man, you know, I can preach better. Or this is, forget it, man. You know, I'm not going to listen. You just talk nonsense. Then you will learn nothing. Conversely, if you have a preacher who is, they are used to the word boring, which is true. One of the things I, 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 I'm quite afraid of is bore you to sleep. But, I, early days when I started preaching, I, I get very upset when I can count the number of people sleeping. Then I say, is, is it because I'm very boring? Huh? Then later I realized when I worked with Dr. Tong, even for him, people sleep. In the expository preaching in True Way Presbyterian Church, I can tell you exactly who is going to sleep. Some people come to sleep one. They come and then they walk, walk, walk. Then they, they always go to the same seat. Then they sit down and then, you, 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 you. one, two, three. <laughs> It cannot be me, right? I mean, just I just open my mouth only, you're sleeping already. It cannot be me. And 
some people very daring. In the early days with Dr. Tong, you, you dare to sleep before him, you are very brave, I say. But these days, people don't care. There was this lady who stepped right in front, right first step. And Dr. Tong mellowed down a lot already. So there was one session, she actually talked about her. <laughs> then she, let me wake up, sleep again. I was amazing. I was so afraid that he would go and get people to kick her out, but he didn't. So he has she changed quite a lot. And she was, wow, I tell you, the only thing missing is she didn't snore. That's all, you know. If you think that the pastor is boring, it's like a tap that drips down, tick, tick, tick. <laughs> you wait a long time for him to have some words of wisdom. You tick a little bit. Ah, but if you put a bowl underneath a dripping tap, in due time, the bowl will be filled up. Am I right? Because the bowl is open to receive it. In the same manner, if your pastor or your preacher or whatever is boring, but you have a heart that is open and you're willing to learn. Humble, teachable. You learn. And yes, in my lifetime, I have worked with pastors who are not exactly the best preachers. And of course, those are super powerful, like our senior pastor. And you learn from every one of them. If you have a heart that is humble and teachable, if you have a heart that is like a bottle close up with a bottle cap, doesn't matter which preacher you're talking about or what big preacher out there. It doesn't make a difference. For God opposes the prop and gives grace to the humble. And Jesus Christ then said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning with Jerusalem. The resurrected Jesus Christ continued to unfold the plan of God. And the plan of God goes to the next phase. That repentance for the forgiveness of sin. This is why the Reformed Evangelical Church believe in the preaching of repentance. Because Jesus Christ himself said that. Many mega church out there, popular churches, a lot of people, thousands and thousands of people join them because they don't want to preach repentance. Because repentance is a jarring thing to listen to. Ah, you make me feel guilty. You make me feel sinful. We do that because Jesus Christ says so. Repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. And the most important verse in the, today's passage comes next. You are the witnesses to these things. Luke 24, 48. My dear, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, we have arrived at the crucial point on the unfolding of God's plan. For our Lord's work is done. He died on a cross, crucified. On the third day, he rose from the dead and then he ascended into heaven. And the next phase of the unfolding of the plan of God rests with you. Jesus said, you are the witnesses of these things. And the word witness is a personal word. You are witness because you are in it. Not because you hear of it, you learn of it, you get a PhD in it. No. You are the witness. You are there. You are the one who experienced it. You are the one who knows it. So I call you as a witness to come forth to tell of it because you have gone through it. Not, I read about it. I saw your Netflix. I, I hear some pastor talk about it. No. You are the witness. Herein lies one of the most profound and difficult thing to understand in the work of faith. Uh, certainly it is for me. Whenever I talk about this, I am always reminded of the three humiliations of God that I have shared with you many times. And I keep wanting to share this with you because I cannot find a better description. And I think if you can remember this, it will be great. The British playwright Dorothy Sayers, who lived in the time of J.R.R. Tolkien, the guy who wrote Lord of the Rings, wrote that in the existence of God, there are three humiliations. That means God has to go through three things that really make him very malu. Uh. First, incarnation. That God Almighty should come as a baby. And that's no small deed, you know, that he has to, to, to live like a baby among the creatures that he has created. I always tell 
whoever that is going to give birth in Mount Alvernia Hospital. The Mount Alvernia Hospital is the only place in Singapore I know of that you will see a statue of Mary breastfeeding Jesus Christ. <laughs> Sacrilege. How can that be? Then what? You think Mary have what? Kim, uh, cream, uh, whatever. See me S22 or whatever. Milk powder. Uh. Don't have right. He def she definitely have breastfeed Jesus Christ. The, the God Almighty. That's why the Roman Catholic have the idea. Blessed Mary. What's the next verse? Mother of God. So, you know, they have that kind of concept which we don't agree. But certainly Mary would have breastfed Jesus. It's the incarnation. It, God Almighty is to rely on Mary. And Mary forget to feed him and he'll starve to death, okay? That's a humiliation of God. Second is crucifixion. That we all understand. That God Almighty should be crucified by his creatures. And it's the third one that's most interesting. The third humiliation of God is the church. The Odyssey says the humiliation of God comes when God entrusted his reputation to ordinary, sometimes very ordinary people. So here is the third humiliation of God. That God Almighty should be represented by people such as you and I. And Jesus said, you are the witnesses. We are so used to this concept of Christianity and us being Christian that we never think about this deeply, you know. You know how weird that is? I mean, we have just gone through an election in Singapore, the People's Action Party, you know. And this COVID thing is like a like a examination for all nations, right? <laughs> so some nations are failing quite badly. Uh, we have, everything sort of worked very well. Why? Because they hire all the scholars, well, right? Do you know that every single one of the minister is some scholar from some Stanford, MIT, whatever it is? None of them is from some Kuchikura distance learning university. Not that distance learning university is bad, right? But these are like from Stanford, MIT, or they got so many degrees they throw at you, you, you will drown. <laughs> and they are all very brilliant people because they screen them like crazy. You want to be a member of parliament with the PAP, you think so easy. You have to do a lot of tea party. <laughs> you talk to a lot of people. First thing they will check la, whether you got cheated during PSLE or not. <laughs> Whatever, la, they call themselves whiter than white, right? And you are talking about a secular organization here, you know, an organization that got nothing to do with God. So if I ask you, who, who among you think that you're qualified to be a minister? Or PAP MP la. Okay, PAP MP, don't talk about minister first. Who, who, who? Raise your hand. Anybody? Have more confidence lah. Come on. Anyone? Don't have, right? Because you think about it also, you say, oh, yeah, you know, how can that be? And here you are representing God. Does it not blow your mind that, that God will call you? Come on. Why don't we call what Lee Kuan Yew or some other people who are like so qualified? Why? He called you, like you are the one. You, know? you are the witnesses. Jesus Christ said it's you. And as witnesses of God, I will tell you honestly that God really took the risk to appoint you, you know. And the reason why Dorothy Sayers says it's a humiliation is because we always messed up, isn't it? Come on. You know, the, the way we live our life, the way we do things, and so much so that a lot of you have the illusion that, you know, all I need to do is to give money to the church. Then the church is going to hire some fast talker like Pastor Yong or Pastor Stephen Tong. And then they go and do all their rally thing. And yeah, la, then we all at the back keep shouting, we you know, that, that you, you chong, la, you know, and then we all at the back support you. Not so. One of the great teachers in the Reformed Church today is a guy called John Mahatha Jr. John Mahatha Jr. says, one thing I've observed in all my years of ministry is that the most effective and important aspects of evangelism usually take place on an individual, personal level. Most people do not come to Christ as an immediate response to a sermon they hear in a crowded setting. They come to Christ because of the influence of an individual. When I was a teenager, I participated in the first grand-scale gospel rally in Singapore when the late, great Billy Graham came to Singapore to preach at the outdoor stadium. I showed you one of those pictures before, right? Long, long time ago. I, I found it by accident. I was only 16 years old. I was one of the counsellors. And I remember, you know, when Billy Graham, like our senior pastor, Dr. Tong, preached, and then we do outer call. Wow, you know, the people come down like water. And so, well, it's like, 
so amazing to see so many people respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ. But I must admit to you that as a young man, listening to Billy Graham the first night, I was not, well, I hate to use the word impressed. <laughs> We're well, expecting an earth-shaking kind of a sermon, right? So I listen to the sermon, okay, la, quite good. La. I, I suppose I'm quite arrogant too. La. So it's like, okay, la, quite good. La. But, uh, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not flawed. I'm not... I mean, by then, I heard a lot of sermons, including those of Dr. Tong. See, uh, actually, Stephen Tong is better. <laughs> but how come the people respond like water? They come down like, wow, some people crying, you know, like, it's like, very moving, you know. I came to realize later that it's because of a lot of prep work that they had done. Before every gospel rally of Billy Graham, two years before the people will start to go and prep all the churches, to tell the people that, you know, the gospel rally is coming, you all go and tell your friends, you go and talk to your friends, you go and preach the gospel. Then they also teach the false preacher law thing to everybody first, two years. And so the prep is there. And so it was a time of harvesting more than anything else, that people commit their life to Jesus Christ exactly as my author say, because of individual effort. So you are indeed the witnesses. Please do not think that it's all up to the ability of a grand uh, evangelist of uh, speaking in a rally that people come to see the Lord. No, it's about you. You are the witnesses for God. I am convinced that people are loved into Jesus Christ much more than they are argued into Jesus Christ. It is true that we need to answer, according to the Apostle Peter, the questions that people have. But please do not think that by arguing stronger, you will win people to Christ. It's not. You are the witnesses and people will come to know Christ because of you. May I also say that the reverse is true. Because you are the witnesses, there will be many people who will not know Christ or refuse to become Christian because of you, because of who you are, because of the things you say, because of the things you behave. One of the strangest things I've ever encountered is I was with this person who is a church leader, but this person is known to be very mean and difficult. And we were in a meeting with secular people trying to talk about the maintenance of a building. So all these maintenance workers are called together to talk about why the building is not maintained properly and all that. My goodness, and this guy was like going after them. Why are you all so stupid? Huh? I already told you all, must do this, do this, not done. What kind of nonsense company are running all that? It was very awkward, very tense. And I sat there thinking, my goodness, there's no need to use those words. You don't have to be so mean. I mean, people may not do it well, but they're not stupid or whatever it is. You don't have to use the word stupid over and over again. And guess what happened? Towards the end, the guy started preaching, you know. Well, you know, actually, uh, you know, in life, uh, you all must put your faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, Jesus loved you. And, 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 and all the, hey, you look at the face of all these people, it's like, Why? what's happening? <laughs> it's crazy. I will tell you, I won't be surprised if any one of them say, because of you, I will never be a Christian. What nonsense is this? You want me to be a Christian when you behave like that? Now, I'm not saying that we are all perfect, right? I mean, including me, we all have flaws. What have you? And the preaching of the gospel cannot be done by perfect people. Because if that were the case, Matthew 23, when the Pharisees stand on the throne of Moses and preach, you've got to listen to his message and don't do what he, he does. So the principle is that no matter who you are, you must share the gospel. But surely it's reasonable for people to expect that if you are witnesses for Jesus Christ, you jolly well be able to demonstrate the love and teaching of Jesus more often than not, and it is definitely reasonable to think that people will not come to Christ on the reverse because of us. Mahatma Gandhi says that I like your Christ, I don't like your Christians, because your Christians are so unlike your Christ. Good thing to remember. And Jesus Christ then said, Behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. And he led them out as far as Bethany. And lifting up his hand, he blessed them. While he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up in heaven. Verse 52. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And the Gospel of Luke ends 
with verse 53, and were continually in the temple, blessing God Almighty. Great joy. And so the unfolding plan of God include the burning of the heart with great joy. Now, I want you to know that only the Apostle Luke recorded the ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ. And Luke actually wrote more than anyone else in the New Testament. Maybe surprised for you to hear that. The, you, many people think that Paul wrote the most. Yes, in terms of number of books, Paul wrote the most. In terms of words, the Apostle Luke wrote the most. Because the Gospel of Luke is just book one. It was followed by the Acts of the Apostle. Because we see that in the Gospel of Luke, in the beginning, Luke says that it was a dedication to a guy called Theophilus. And in the Gospel, in the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1, verse 1, in the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. So our brother Damawan actually read to us, the added description of the ascension of, towards the end of the Gospel of Luke, there was brief description, but Acts chapter 1 gives added description of what the ascension is all about. So the unfolding plan of God continued. Acts chapter 1 verse 6, So they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? This is one of uh, Dr. Tong's favourite verse because it really demonstrates the stupidity of the people. Even at that time, they still ask Jesus, are you restoring the earthly kingdom? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or season that the Father has fixed by his own authority. And here comes the most famous verse in Acts 1 verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be again my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, and we hereby would end the Gospel of Luke's preaching session, but the end of the Gospel of Luke is the beginning of our role as the witnesses of God. And this is very clear in the Bible. And Acts then recorded how the ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ happened. Now, of course, when we study the Bible, we're not really particularly interested in whether it's a Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, or Luke per se, but what the actual message is all about. Know that the unfolding plan of God includes you as a witnesses to Him. And guess what? You are not left alone. Because you will sit down there and say, why me? I'm no, I got nothing. I got no power. I got nothing. But Jesus Christ said in Matthew 28, in the Great Commission that we are familiar with, and Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded to you. And behold, I am with you always at the end of the age. And so the unfolding story of Jesus Christ after his ascension is that we all become his witnesses. And we are not his witnesses with no power. All the Holy Spirit is given to us to empower us to go forth and make disciples of all nations because all authority has already been given to our Lord Jesus Christ. And we are His followers. May we truly be His witnesses on this world, empowered by Him, like the early apostles, living life with a burning heart for Him, filled with joy every day. For we are followers of God Almighty, who love us so much that His scars on His hands constantly remind us that He was crucified for our sake and resurrected for our sake. May we always live the life and the life abundantly. Let us pray. We thank you, O God, for guiding us through the Gospel of Luke. And like all reading of your word, we continue to be amazed at how profound it is for your word is truth. Grant to us a lifelong attitude of humility and teachability so that when we listen to your word, it will not be resisted by our pride, but will come into our heart. May our heart always be prepared like good soil so that your word will come in and take root. And may we always be burning with passion for you as we understand what this is all about. The unfolding plan of God. 
where we are appointed as witnesses for you. We will never know why that's the case. For surely you can find better people out there, people who are a lot more intelligent than us, who have better moral standing, people who have life seems to be in control, but yet you have caught us. And so may we accept the calling with great humility and trust that you will use us like the, you, the way you use the five loaves and two fish of the little boy to be a blessing for people all around us. All we need to do is to come to you in humility, in sincerity, submit ourselves completely to you and be humble and teachable and you will surely use us. For Jesus Christ said, when we ask, when we knock and when we seek, you shall be found of us. May all of us live a life that you have meant for us to live. A life that is just filled with the love, with the joy, with the peace, with the patience, with the kindness, the goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. For all this mark your presence in our life. May we truly bring glory to your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.